All right, welcome to part two of this video. Um, my last video was cut short because my phone heated up. So I am now in the shade and I actually just uh, finished uh, having a cup of coffee with a friend at Tim Hortons, believe it or not. So I know there's a little bit of a stereotype going on with Canadians that we all love Tim Hortons. While it's true, it's true. Like I pretty much have a Tim Hortons coffee every single day, whether I need it or not. So yeah, we're, we're pretty loyal to Tim Hortons. But I wanted to finish my thoughts around Matthew 24. So in the last video, I talked a little bit about Jesus Christ having a conversation with his disciples, the Olivet Discourse. They were admiring the temple and he told them, he said, look, not one stone is going to be left. And then they pulled him aside, depending which which gospel you read, if it's Mark or Luke. They actually pull him aside privately, which is interesting, and ask him, basically, Master, show us, tell us when these things are going to happen, as in when these, these stones uh, basically get removed from the temple, get basically getting leveled, and what are the signs of your coming, and also the end of the world and i think that's a that's a fair question and what's interesting is jesus christ had a relationship with his disciples that once they understood their authority that he basically gave them power to tread on scorpions and everything they can actually approach jesus christ and say declare unto us what these parables mean meaning they're basically asking Jesus to explain things to them, and he would explain it. That tells me that we have more authority than we fully realize or we fully appreciate. We can actually go to the Father because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to teach us all things and to remind us of everything that Jesus Christ has said. So we can go boldly into the throne and have requests. We can ask him for things. So in this case, at the Olivet Discourse, the disciples are basically saying, declare us what's going to happen in the future. When are these things going to happen? So Jesus goes on to say, look, you're going to see nation rise against nation you're going to hear wars rumors of wars you're going to see earthquakes in diverse places which just means it's in remote areas and don't fret don't worry because this is not the end this this is what you call birth pains and what happens is in a normal pregnancy is there will be what's called false labor pains. Basically, a woman will feel like she she's cramping up, there's something going on, and she's like, oh, is this the moment? Could this be the time to go to the hospital? And then it subsides. It's like, oh, okay, not a big deal. So eventually it gets to the point where when her water breaks, that's it. You got to be at the hospital. You, you have to be that baby's coming within 24 hours. Like that baby's coming. So that is what Jesus is talking about. Is like, you're going to have this, but that's not the end. So when the end comes, there's no stopping it. That's Jacob's trouble. So Jesus was prepping the disciples by saying, look, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have wars. You're going to have rumors of wars, all this kind of stuff. And I, I find it fascinating that Jesus actually spent the time to tell his disciples and now we get the privilege of reading from the scriptures as well and what's interesting in Matthew is when Jesus is saying when you see the abomination of desolation occur standing in a place that I think I'm paraphrasing now that he's not supposed to stand which would be the temple let the reader that's reading understand 
that you should be fleeing to Jerusalem when you see this happen. So the reader, whoever is reading this, should flee. Flee from Judea. Why? Because now the Antichrist is making his home there. And there's a lot of problems going on. So that alone should tell you that we're not going to be around. This this is proof right here that there is a rapture. This The, the one verse that Jesus says and and the writer of Matthew actually put in parentheses, let the reader that readeth understand that when this happens, what they're to do next. So picture the rapture, picture the body of Christ his flesh, his bones, leaving earth and picture somebody picking up the gospel of Matthew and then you see in parentheses, let the reader know this is what's going on. That is the audience for the gospel of Matthew. It's primarily going to be for people that are left behind, meaning they didn't know about Jesus Christ. They might have heard about him but in reality, demons know about Jesus Christ. They know he exists. But they're condemned for all eternity. They made their choice. They left the first estate. So, they left their first state, I should say. So, they're, they're condemned already. So, when we look at that, we have to approach it from the verse from the perspective that the people reading the gospel of Matthew are left behind because again we are not ordained unto wrath that is so crystal clear like you can't you can't get around that we're not as the bride of Christ we're not to be drugged through the mud it's ridiculous it's a ridiculous idea the post tribulation idea is a ridiculous thought it goes contrary to everything that Paul taught. That to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We, we are actually, when we die, we go straight to heaven. And there's so many people that argue and fight with you on this. They're like, nope, nobody's in heaven right now. Nope. We're actually, we're all in the ground. We're dead and buried. And when the second coming happens... Even though the book of Revelation mentions that Jesus Christ is on a white horse coming from heaven with his armies, with the host and his armies, which, which means we are with him because we're in heaven. Who do you think gets on those white horses following him down to earth? You have to have people in heaven to do that. And people just skip over this. They're like, no, 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 those are spirits. We're coming back for our body. Who told you we're coming back for these corrupt bodies, the bodies that have let us down? Who told you that? Who taught you that we're coming back for these bodies? Show me in scripture where you see that. You don't see it. Instead, what you see is you see Paul mentioning the fact that when we get planted... We don't get that body anymore. We get a new heavenly body. Why? It's because it's in the image of the heavenly. Who's the heavenly? It's the last Adam. So we're ditching the image of Adam. We're ditching it. Why? Because it it's serpent food. Our bodies decompose and corrupt and turn to dust. We're not coming back to get these bodies. We get a new heavenly body because, again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that when we are planted into the ground, a seed is produced and now our desire is to be clothed upon. We don't desire to be unclothed. We don't desire to just be spirits floating in, around in heaven for thousands of years, incomplete, because that would mean Jesus Christ's work on the cross is I'm finished. And I'm pretty sure that Jesus Christ said it is finished. And if you look up finished in Greek, in Hebrew, in Latin, in Swahili, finished means done. So there's no more work to be done. 
So you can't say that there are people in heaven right now that don't have physical bodies. You can't say that because that means they are incomplete in heaven. We are more than complete in heaven. In fact, we are more than complete right now. We have these fleshly bodies that we're going to do away with one day. Done. But we have a new heavenly body, a morning star, if you will, that is designed by Jesus Christ himself. He designed it. Remember when he was speaking to his disciples, he said, I ha when I go away, I'm going to my father's house. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not true, I would have told you. But if I go away, I'm coming back so that I can receive you to myself. So these rooms are where our spirit is going to occupy. What are these rooms? Well, those are our heavenly bodies. Paul talks about it over and over again. He talks about when this house dissipates, dissolves, we have a new heavenly body awaiting us. This is what we're eagerly waiting for, our, the redemption of our heavenly bodies. It's not this body. We're not waiting for these bodies. And this is what confuses a lot of people. They're like, well, in the resurrection, it's like, well, Jesus Christ corrected Martha. She said, in the resurrection, Lazarus will, will rise. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the light. I am the day. I am the last day. I am the first day. If you have the day, you have the light. Jesus is the light. So, when Jesus is telling this to his disciples, he is prepping them. He's letting them know that, hey, one day I am coming back for you. I'm coming back for you. And then Jacob's trouble is going to commence for seven years. We know this. We know this. And the devil is going to realize after the abomination of desolation, after he gets kicked out of heaven, that he has a short time. Three and a half years. And then he gets tossed into the lake of... He gets actually tossed into a bottomless pit for a thousand years for a short season. So Jacob's trouble is not for Christians. It's not for the church. Jacob's trouble came about because Israel wanted God to leave them alone and treat them equitably, fairly, equally. Meaning, they were accusing God of putting a hedge around other nations and not them. Saying, you're not fair. You're not being equal. Those people are evil and you're not wiping them out. So you're not fair. You're not being fair because you're, you're keeping those people alive that are wicked. So you're not a fair God. And God's talking to them. I think it was through Jeremiah. Saying, I'm not fair. You're not fair. You're saying I'm not fair because I'm not destroying all these nations around you because they're wicked. So if I use that same recommendation by you, you won't last a second. Why? Because you're not righteous. So don't tell me that I'm not being fair. I am being more than fair. In fact, I'm going to show you how much more fair I am. I'm going to not save you because you're righteous. I'm going to save you because my son is righteous. And I am going to accept him as the perfect sacrifice. I'm going to justify you because of what my son did. I'm going to create a new covenant. Not the same covenant that I created with your fathers. I'm going to do a new thing. Which is I'm going to circumcise their heart. And I'm going to write all my laws on their heart. And they will worship me. And I will worship them. I will be their God. And they will serve me. And I will unite two nations. 
This is in Ezekiel 38, 39. Two nations will become one. Northern Israel, also known as Joseph, a branch, and then Judah. And I'm going to put those two nations together. They will no longer be two nations. They will be one nation under God. And I will be their shepherd. Who's the I? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be their shepherd. Jesus Christ is the branch. So this is the plan that was predestined before the foundation of the world. That God had a plan in place to work everything out so that he could save the world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is what God is up to. This is what God is doing. And he justifies us because of what his son Jesus Christ did on the cross. He died for our sins. He nailed all of our iniquities, past, present, and future. All in Hebrew, in Greek, in Latin, in Swahili is everything. It's all. All is all. So he nailed all your sins, all your iniquities. So you can't out sin his grace. You can't do that. It's impossible. You can't out sin his grace. You can't do it. Can't be done. So because of that, God justifies us because of what his son did, not what Israel did, not what we did. And he passed all judgment onto Jesus Christ. As in Jesus Christ is the judge. He's the ultimate judge. And he's not judging his church. He's not judging his body. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So now you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit on our side. So I asked the question, who can separate us from the love of God? No one can. Angels, people, man, no one can separate us from his love. So once you understand that, once you understand God's character, God's who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, there's so much that is planned for us. There's so much. We just can't see it fully because we're, we're too busy spending time worrying about all these things that are going to come one day upon the earth. And Jesus said, don't worry. Just pray that you're counted worthy to escape. What does escape mean? It means to leave your garment behind. Escape. That's what escape means. Joseph escaped. Escape. Escaped. Potiphar's wife, he left his cloak behind because he didn't want to sleep with her. He fled. He fled. That's what escape means. Escape, escape means avoiding destruction. It is an escape plan for the church, for the body. It is definitely 100% an escape plan. and That is okay. Jesus has provided a way for the world to escape his wrath. What is that? That's knowing who he is, who Jesus Christ is on a personal level. You have to know that he died for us and that he rose again and he will never be killed again. And we have a seat in heavenly places. We are joint heirs in Christ forever. That's pretty cool. Very cool. So I hope and pray that you got something out of this video. I hope this spoke to you. I hope you do a deep dive and you understand what the cost was. That it cost Jesus Christ everything. It cost his life for us and he picked up his life again so now he could be the first fruits of those that sleep in him those that die in Christ are instantaneously 
with him. We know this. So if you got something out of this, feel free to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to leave a comment. Uh, feel free to leave a thumbs up. And uh, I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.